Hawaiians are travelers. We are the people of the canoe. Our ancestors journeyed great distances, navigating by the stars and following the birds of the sky to reach our home. What seems impossible was achieved through a learned awareness of the sky, its cycles, its rhythms. Hawaiian life is full of rhythms, as we mark when to fish and when to plant. Even today, modern Hawaiian life is a study of the rhythm and melody of the aina, the kai, and our daily routines and actions. Musicians use these rhythms and melodies as inspiration. And here in Hawaii, one of the greatest examples of this is the musical journey of Brother Nolan. Through a career that now spans five decades, Nolan has been on his awana, or journey. His songs are all unique, but they share the common fingerprint of being Hawaiian, written from a Hawaiian perspective. And for this creativity in songwriting, Brother Nolan is a true master of Hawaiian music. E ho mai kai ki mai luna mai e O na me au na no ya o na mini E ho mai E ho mai E ho mai E ho mai kai ki mai luna mai e O na me au na no ya o na mini E ho mai E ho mai E ho mai, e ho mai kaike, mai luna mai e, o na me au na no ya o na me le. E ho mai, e ho mai. When I was really young, uh, we didn't have much, so. Uh, but, we, but I did have my imagination. Yeah, so uh, I, th I think it's vivid. So I use my imagination a lot, yeah. The roots uh, trace back on my mom's side to uh, Kailua Kona and Honolulu Kona, Moko Kehave, Ripiko, as we say in Hawaiian, Ripiko there, our belly buttons is on the big island. On my uh, dad's side, uh, that will probably be the Waimanalo area of Oahu. Grandma and Grandpa, and they came over from the Philippines. Our house was very, very musical and very dance oriented because uh, Mama was a hula dancer in the family. And even on my dad's side, uh, everybody's pretty musical. So it's, uh, it's a natural order in our household. During the time that I grew up, in the early 60s up to the 70s, there was only one Hawaiian radio station to AM. So very limited, but the families, oh, the families would play the Hawaiian music, you know, like oral translation, you know, passed down from generation to generation. So uh, I grew up in that same environment where, wow, we were little kids and we were just listening to uh, elders singing everything. And uh, the colorful and beautiful thing about the Hawaiian music was every time you would hear it again at a different party or a different family's house, uh, it would be their rendition, yeah, and it made the, the music sound so uh, open and flexible, you know, sort of like the waves. Because my mom and dad got divorced and I was at such a uh, young age, you know, second grade, so I got moved around a lot, you know, so I was kind of like always on an adventure, you know. All of those things, I think, affected me as a person and the music. And the music, yeah. So once I knew that I had some kind of poetic intelligence, yeah, I started to uh, exercise it.
you grow up as a kid, you hear, hear about aloha and all that, but you're not really sure what that aloha means. You just know it's like, it's like, like good behavior or something. I started to observe the different households and their different rhythms in the way that they conducted their ohana or their family. You know, and in that I saw, I, you know, I saw it musically, like, you know, and, and you know, when you see things melodically, it's beautiful. You have to have that connection with aloha to, to understand uh, the rhythm of Hawaii. Then I specific teachers too, that actually, you know, said, come, come with me. I show you, yeah, I show you how it's done. Hawaiians have a thing called hanai, which is a, a loose terminology for adoption. But we just do it in a very family-oriented or ohana way. And that is we just bless another family with another child. And it's usually the most rascal child. It's the one that you bless the other family with. Here, take this one. Take that one. You can have that one. Here, love them up. <laughs> so anyway, I was destined to be fostered in an area uh, on the Big Island called Waimea or Kamuela, and that is known as Park Ranch country. I was so fortunate to be raised as well up there uh, in that beautiful country, uh, the 5,000 foot level off the slopes of Mauna Kea. I have seen some beautiful sunsets. I've seen Mauna Kea every color imaginable, purple, green, blue, red with the moon. I mean, just so wonderful. The horses and the cows used to run free. And if, they, if the cowboys would release them in a paddock, like this section, and I get up in the morning, and there'd be like 100 horses in front of us. You know, and they're all grazing. And they'd be there for maybe two, three days. Then you get up, you know, and then next morning they're gone. You know? And then fog would roll in for like, you know, two, three, four days. And the next time you get up, got all the cattle in here. And when we were growing up there in, on the Big Island, uh, my uncle, his name is Herbert Ako. Some of you might have heard of him. He was a great lavaia and a great uh, va'a man or a kanu. Uh, kanu is va'a. And he made paddles, like just elite, beautiful collector's item paddles. And when we were little kids, he used to sit us down on the beach and tell us how to watch the wave patterns. It would sound something like this. He would sing songs about our uh, home or our home. Okay. Boy, get me one beer. Bring the poo poos. And then you go, ha a hey, ika bali. And I can still hear his voice sometimes, especially the part, bring me one more beer. <laughs> and uh, he taught us so much things about the ocean and how the ocean is the Hawaiian's icebox. Yeah, that's where we get all our uh, mea ai or our food. And later on when I got a little bit older and I started recording, I recorded the same song, Konakaiopua, but I gave it the flair or the Brother Nolanism. Help me out, guy. Walk it. Ha'ayo Ikamaliye Okona kai opua Ikalai Kila kila Oh walalai Oh, 
Alay kao ikamaka o kao buang Malalay tao mai iluna Kahide i ano na kona Hano hano O kona kahe o bua i galai O bua i nano ta i tamali Uvai na bai kamaka ka o bua a o now this is call and respond. O kona kai o pua, ke kai ma o ki o ki. O kona kai o pua, she shai ma o ki o ki. Ke kai malino a o kona. I don't want you to forget this place. A o kona, a o kona, a o kona kai o pua ai salai. A o kona ke kai malino ke kai malino. Brother Nolan and I share a lot of things in common. Our mothers were good friends. We both love to fish and to malama the aina. We both come from musical families. And we both share the unique experience of living both a rural life and an urban life. For Nolan, the contrast between spending time in Waimea on the Big Island and his time on Poor Lane became the inspiration for a life spent in musical and lyrical study of the rhythms of life here in Hawaii. This pursuit gave voice to his larger quest, defining what it was meant to be Hawaiian. But like other Hawaiian musicians, it was his days at Kumimia schools that launched him towards his musical career. My mom, who was living on Oahu at the time, said, I want you to come back to Oahu and I want you to take a test. Yeah. And I thought it was my ADD test. You know, so I thought, oh my goodness, I hope I can pass this ADD test. So anyway, I come down to Oahu and they, they take me up to this, uh, up on the top of a mountain. It was called Kapalama Heights and it was a, on a campus. And I thought, boy, this is a big doctor's office. This campus is huge. Yeah, and anyway, I took this test and I passed it. Yeah, and little did I know that it was a, a test for the Kamehameha schools. Kamehameha was a real military-oriented school in the beginning, you know, trying to uh, formulate young Hawaiians to be a particular way. You know, a lot of the entertainers, as far as the Renaissance goes, outside of, say, Gabi, for, for music, yeah, a lot of them were from Kamehameha, right? So, I mean, Kamehameha has that influence, you know? that musical influence for sure, just the song contest, all of that stuff, you know. It was like a cultural uprising. And then all of a sudden there was just this whole uh, boom of figuring out who am I and where do I stand in the struggle. When I was growing up at my, my grandma's house, I slept on the outside Pune, which was right next to a, uh, a Britannica encyclopedias. So she would always tell me, go read the encyclopedia. So, you know, I, I would read, and then that's why I started playing with the words, you know, the, like kind of like a wordsmith, you know. But, and then once I discovered that, wow, I could get melodic, yeah, then, and play an instrument, then, then I, then I saw the connection. Then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, Wow, this whole thing is a rhythm. <laughs> this whole thing, oh. I start, understood rhythm, yeah, and timing, and syncopation, and all those kinds of things. So, and not intellectually, yeah, organically, yeah. I was very fortunate to have a tutu who had a boat. Yeah, one of those, like, like a Boston whaler or something, you know? And he was a fisherman. And he used to, you know, when we were growing up, we weren't like really rich, you know. 
but he was a great fisherman so he was able to uh, sustain ourselves through fishing and he also could uh, sell them to all the different hotels so what happened was uh, we didn't have money to go learn how to, to swim when we were little kids like we couldn't join the YMCA you know and train to be a guppy guppy or a minnow and get our pins you know we didn't have that opportunity we had to learn how to swim the Hawaiian way and the Hawaiian way is your grandpa loads all the kids up on the boat <laughs> when you're about this high yeah and he takes you out to the second buoy <laughs> and he anchors the, the boat and then he one by one he tells you to step up yeah, and of course, uh, I was a rascal one, or Kolohe. Uh, my Hawaiian name is Kaleo. So what he would do is line up all the kids and he said, Okay, Kaleo, you first. So I would walk up to him and he said, You know how to swim? No. And he'd pick you up and he'd throw you in the ocean. You surface. As soon as you surface, you start swimming toward the boat, but you're screaming. I can't swim! I can't swim! Okay, you swim to the boat, picks you up, and says, What do you say, boy? I can't swim! Launches you further. As you float to the surface, you're finding Nemo now. Get up to the top. I cannot swim! I cannot swim! As you swim to the boat, picks you up. What do you say, boy? I cannot swim! It's the big launch. And they say it happens in threes. Yeah. As this time as I surface, the only thing I can think of is ding ding. Ding ding. <laughs> and as I surface, I go, I can swim! I can swim! As I swim to the boat, picks you up and said, What do you say, boy? I can swim! Next. And I was backing up like my brother Tony, who was also a uh, a prodigy performing at the age of 14 and 15. And then again, my brother Kaipo, who was a major influence on, I just used to want to follow him and play like him. So, you know, going to the big island and moving up there and uh, uh, getting a chance to play some songs that I wrote myself and played in a club in Waimea. I think that was all influential to, into shaping Brother Nole, you know. So by the time I uh, left Waimea and started to think in my mind that, wow, I want to try and do this professionally. Because I was sort of doing it professionally, playing solo in, uh, on the Big Island, but almost no count. Huh? <laughs> it counts when you come to Wau, that's like the big arena. Yeah. And I remember auditioning for some of the clubs in Waikiki. And I, but I had my ammo, you know. And then, and then, of course, when they said, oh, wow, yeah, do you want to play here nightly? in the nightclubs like that. I had to have a name. I went the rough and rugged road too, you know, played in nightclubs for like, you know, 15, 20 years too. This long train running over here. And one of the reasons I played solo in my mind in the very beginnings was I wanted to be able to be self-sustaining, which is my whole, you know, my whole thing. You know, I mean, I, I've thought of that. I, I figure like from the time I was a kid, I was on my own. On a, on a walkabout, yeah, and a lot of things I had to figure out myself. My mom was a kumu hula, or yeah, or a master in the, in the hula teaching, and my brother, uh, Tony Conjugation, is also a pretty revered kumu hula here in Hawaii today. You know, he's won the Merry Monarch and done all those kinds of things. So hula and music in our family and the luau's and all that was always uh, like just part of our lives. So, you know, I was, I was always playing. <laughs> And I could imitate the old voice. Hey, Boy, my mom used to slap me upside the head. You know? If you're familiar with Hawaiian music, uh, the vamp sort of sounds like this. And it's like a kaholo, so that the hula dancer can dance. And, uh, you know, again, I was Nolanizing music. So I told my mom, I wrote a song and I changed the vamp. And she said, oh yeah? I said, yeah, I made the vamp like this.
And she said, get in the timeout. <laughs> you better learn about your culture. Right? So she gave me the dictionary and she gave me the Bible. And she said, read, boy. Lock me in the bathroom. So I used to do this. God is the God is he who struggles with God. And that's how I learned about the Bible and stuff. On the other hand, dictionary, open up, I'm going to super casual, fragilistic, expialidocious. Yeah, and that's why today I am what I am. <laughs> a songwriter, a lyricist, and an innovator of music. Bye-bye, poor lane. I'm really gonna miss your face, your eyes to be seeing for me. I said bye bye, poor lane. So, so long, poor lane. I said many a memory ever with you, but your eyes they make me blow. I said bye bye, poor lane, yeah. Bye bye bye, poor lane. I see tears always fall from my eyes. Oh, to think of the way that we live. I said bye bye, poor lane. So, so long, poor lane. Oh, dear God, I hope that all my friends don't know, don't you shatter their dreams. Now don't shadow them to a lane, yeah. Bye bye bye, poor lane. Oh dear God, I hope that all my friends leave. No, no, don't you shatter their dreams. Now don't shatter them to a lane over why. Seeing that you never, never, never seen the change that everyone could see you. I sure they'd say bye bye, poor lane, au revoir, poor lane. Seems you never, you never seen the change that everyone could see you. I sure they'd say. Bye bye, poor lane. Aloha, oi, poor lane. I'm gonna miss your, your eyes to be saving for me. I said bye bye, poor lane. Aloha, oi, poor lane. I'm really gonna miss your face. Your eyes, they lie. I said bye-bye, poor lane, goodbye. Uh -huh. When I went to UH, I was like taking notes. I was listening to the notes. I was observing the notes. The notes can be people. I was noticing. Then I kind of put it all together, like music placement, like in a recording studio. And then, oh, all of a sudden I have this thing happening. You know, it's a song. So the two years that I was at UH, it was so uh, influential to, not only to my music, not even me knowing it consciously, yeah, but also influential on how, how my character was being shaped as well, too. I had good teachers, so uh, yeah, I was really all about style, my own style.
Now just look at the, like if you just look at the titles, right? Speaking Brown. Yeah, and then Sega wants to paint the island. Self-released. They got picked up by a Japan record label. Yeah, and and it was just so diverse. Uh, 1980, I think, or 1981. I, I must say, you know, uh, John DeMello recognized that as an artist himself. Recognized that already right off the top. Who are these strangers with different voodoo? Do you do danger when we are near you? Ask us. I was loving trying to arrange and, and get uh, get people to work together. Yeah, I like to do that, putting them together and seeing if they can play together. And we knew that we would play it, we would push the envelope to the edge. Not everyone would like it, you know, you know. People might even disagree, but I don't know how you can disagree with music. As those things occurred, Mount Nambo, as all the things started to occur, the whole attention of, oh, this guy's... Uh, uh, Ken Thompson became my booking agent. He was a big time booking agent at this time. After that, other opening up for John Mayall and up and And it's just getting a little taste of this and that, taste of this. And then as I got a little bit more independent of myself, like recognizable, you know, and I started to go beyond the reef, started to have a taste of all that. Ari Native was uh, uh, the perspective from uh, someone that's the host culture, yeah, looking out uh, to his or her eyes at uh, the visiting cultures that come in. I had two periods of time where I kind of went like low key and just work uh, as a bellman at the Hilton Hawaiian Village and a doorman. And uh, I needed that break. Yeah, get rooted again, write some more songs. Come now with me Have you ever tripped to reality? Come down with me Come down and see See what they've done to Waikiki Ask me why Open your eyes Can't you see we lost our paradise? It's too many people, not enough sand. Can they see we want our land? And why do I grumble? Concrete jungles in a place where people were once humble. Too much one way sounds a thing they're blind. Can't even recognize a don't walk sign, and here I am. Here I am in the middle, in the middle of the sea. You gotta go down to the water You gotta wash away all your crazy lies Free yourself, let it go Tell the world you're glad to be alive
something sacred about the water. You will feel it when you let it touch your body. It's magical, it's miracles all around a crystal blue design. Here by the water, we've got nothing to hide. Only what's been hiding deep inside. So come on, come on, walk with me. I'll take you to the water. And hold my hand. And I'll lead you to the wonderland. No more Hawaiian style. So you got tourist island and all the things that tourists do, and then you got all your native, all the native things do. And, you know, uh, it kind of connects to all the traditional stuff that I, I grew up in my culture, yeah, which is the Hawaiian culture. Uh, you know, taking that uh, word native, yeah, uh, is uh, kind of like another way of saying primal. Too, yeah. So, yeah, it definitely was a, a seed that would feed. Of course, when I write songs, the, the kauna, or the hidden meaning behind the songs is each song I'm writing as if it pertains to me as well as to others. Two. One, two, three, go. If I'm going to write in the English language, it's still going to have the Hawaiian kauna in it. It's going to have the Hawaiian connotations to it. That's not overlooked. I'm, I'm thinking about that. Juice of the fruit, a delight of the tummy. Dance, dance, your body in the tropical sunlight. She my sweet Asian honey. Juice of the fruit, a delight of the tummy. Oh, dance, dance, your body in the tropical sunlight. I was cruising through the jungle, looking mumbo jumbo, searching for the right one in paradise. And I was in and out of loneliness, walking around with empty hands, searching in the world of wasted time. She, my sweet. Juice of the fruit, the delight of the tummy. Dance, dance, your body in the tropical sunlight. But the Nolan's music is truly unique. He has always looked for an alternative way to play the song. And it was this Nolanizing of songs that led to hits like Coconut Girl and Big Ship, while cementing his place in Hawaiian music as the father of Hawaiian music.
His authenticity rings true in songs like Great Hawaiian Man, which is a brilliant acoustic arrangement, or a song like Are You Native, which is arranged for a full band. Lowland's music proves time and time again that a great song is just that, a great song, no matter if it's played with a full band or solo on an acoustic guitar. I think that in, in songwriting, you have to know you have to know how music works. And the way, I, way, the way I learned, or the way I was taught, was to listen to lots of music and really get beyond just the, the beat and the way the song goes, but like get into the, the, the depth of it or the, the web or the network of what was going on. It's kind of like these two things operating inside your uh, body or the way you wired up. Yeah, the eyes and the ears, yeah, which is very Hawaiian, yeah, your maka and your pepeao. And uh, if you can get those two all wired up and interfacing each other, it's like it is. It's like a computer, you know. And I mean, to me, the way my mind works is it interfaces all the time, my ears and my eyes. And I guess it's being controlled by my brain. It's like the the hard drive in a computer. You know, and then I think that it's connected uh, next to your heart, or the Hawaiians call it pu'ufai, right? And then uh, what the heart does is it brings out the emotion. Then your heart is like your your software. Well, once I heard notes, then wow, I discovered melody. You know, and so you know I attached the harmonica, I attached the ukulele, and I attached the guitar to my body. Yeah, so. Now my guitar is my laptop. And then I had to learn after that how to make a song. Always just enjoyed so much music. Yeah, and I always enjoyed the idea of pushing the envelope and, and all these different musical colors happening. Yeah, and so that's why I wasn't just restricted to, to say Hawaiian music. Yeah. But what, what happened, I was born into Hawaiian music. Yeah, so it was, it's innate, it's like my DNA. Yeah, but what happened is as I started to be influenced by all of the other music of the world, yeah, it kind of went full circle back to the Hawaiian music. Yeah, and then, that, then wow, it's like I've seen all the colors that uh, all the great Hawaiian uh, songwriters were painting. Yeah, but they're painting with a very simple brush. Oh, but that, that allows a lot of space yeah, to uh, involve uh, all kinds of other uh, riffs or patterns yeah, flowing within that, within that uh, structure of music or uh, chord movement. Yeah. Now you got all your gear, yeah? You got your hard drive, you got your software, you got your uh, computer or your laptop, yeah? But you still have to uh, have uh, life experience. What happened with me is that, you know, if you look at my childhood, uh, I was like on an adventure to begin with. I was like on this great walkabout. Yeah, so when, I, when I'm doing this walkabout, I'm not just walking from point A to point B. Yeah, I'm observing everything. Too. Yeah, so the great observation yeah, uh, allowed me to have the experience. Yeah, so I think it's the experience that motivates you to document. Yeah, I guess it's the way you would say it. Uh, and I just happen to document in uh, the melodic language. Yeah, and it, that is very Hawaiian too. You know, like, like, oh, put it in a song instead, or put it in a hula or a dance, you know, uh, or put it in an oli. And of course, Hawaii. I mean, there's, there's so much beauty. Yeah, but I feel that I've been so fortunate to travel to many different places in the world too. 
And there's so much beauty out there in the world too. I guess it's the songs are simple, the songs are happy. Yeah, and, uh, you know, try to be joyous. Yeah, and uh, you know, try to lift, try to lift up to uh, our Creator. Bad things can make you go the wrong way. Use love, love is strong. Love is the only way, and I just wanna let you. Aloha live inside my soul And only love can truly bring us back But bad things they backfire Don't you know We rise above the fire And bad things they backfire Don't you know We rise above the fire Yeah No go come back 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 All right Weird. I love to do that. I love to take one or two chords, which is very Hawaiian too, and and uh, color it around, uh, you know, and and then afterwards it sounds so full. It sounds like this is like an incredible orchestrated piece when really it's only a two chord structure, you know. And then at the same time, I had that whole period of time, like when I was in college, where it's getting into more of the theoretical things where. Wow, I want to play every chord in the world, play every note in the world. I want to make the, I want to make the song with, you know, you know, 25 changes, you know, and that's a whole other approach to, to music, you know, where, where you have all of these uh, uh, almost like percussive changes in your chordings, and then it makes everything else move differently too, yeah? And to me, that's just the, the beauty of music because uh, when you play it, whether you're playing it this way or that way, it communicates off of people's vibration, you know, and they, their heart and their, their, their minds and everything. They feel it, you know, and when they feel it, that's like, that is the universal language, you know. I wrote this song, like, you know, spontaneously after a basketball game, yeah, in the back of the gym. And I was, I was uh, you know, in the back with Willie and the Poor Boys, and we were playing the blues, you know. <laughs> The Peely Blues. Yeah, and then I started doing the George Benson thing. And you know, people like that. Then I started doodling around, and then pretty soon I found this melody. I don't know what happened, man. I wrote a song, and every three months till today, I wrote this song in 1979. Every three months, I checked the mailbox for my royalty check. This is from a movie called Pineapple Express. It goes like this. One, two, one. Okay, you guys warmed up now? You all gonna help me out now. I know some of you know the words. Everybody just follow. I said, someone got a pen up in the poster in the bedroom. Lately, I've been feeling like I don't have the leg room. Goodbye, coconut girl. Come back, hey, fashion world. Take me to the house where the lights are on the wrong night. Take me to the paradise celluloid because the face is on the cover of a magazine. Got me all shaking like a Jimmy Dean. I want to see the purpose of the makeup and the skin. Goodbye, baby. Say 
Fire song, yeah? <laughs> okay, help me out. Here we go. I said goodbye, coconut girl. To my high fashion world woman, I'm goodbye, coconut girl. To my high fashion world. Say goodbye to your coconut girl. And look for boys, say goodbye. I come to you. Coconut girl in a high fashion world. <gasps> yeah. Thank you. Today we don't have the the soul that we had back in the day. I think that that's why the whole idea of uh, being closer to nature. And for each person, it's at a different level. Because when you get really closer to nature, it's a no-brainer that you get closer to God. I think we're so uh, overwhelmed by technology. We have to include some natural time, yeah? some nature time, yeah? and some uh, child to adult time. And Hawaii, there's no better place than Hawaii in that sense where you can incorporate you know, things that you do at the oceans and things that you do in the mountain in a matter of minutes. All those things are some kind of connection, you know, or some idea of what nature is. When you're out in nature, you have the ability, yeah, and the opportunity to engage physically and mentally and spiritually with uh, God on a first-hand basis. And out in nature, whether it be the water, the ocean, uh, the land, the forest, you know, or the sand dune, or uh, you know, the stream. I think that uh, you're so connected to God to begin with, you know, that uh, you just have to develop this natural respect. And that's why I like to take and teach children uh, on a little field trip or adventure so that they can discover for themselves uh, who they are. I think that that's why. Uh, our Heavenly Father created nature, you know, as the original classroom. When I was involved in uh, the uh, Hawaiian movement, I think that was what, the er, me, middle 70s, I was playing this song, Waikiki, Look What They've Done. And I was like the new kid on the block. And after this performance for uh, uh, this Hawaiian movement, event, I met Walter Ritty, the activist, well, I like to say Hawaiian visionary instead. And uh, he asked me, uh, hey, you ever come to Molokai? I'll take you around, you know. Next week, bought a ticket, landed in Molokai, he picked me up, and he introduced me into the very uh, uh, bosom of Molokai, Molokai Nui Ahina, you know that means the child of Hina too. So, and he did that by taking me into the bush and we tracked deer. And I remember the first time I heard a deer call. Oh, and he said, there it is, that's what we're looking for. And so that, that began my whole experience, the Hawaiian experience, the Molokai experience which led into the camps and the survival handbook. I felt that the, the knowledge that I needed to, uh, that I had learned growing up in uh, Hawaii and from all my different teachers was knowledge that uh, we needed to pass down to, to the next generation. This is the manual, okay. This is the manual, uh, the manual of the scope of uh, uh, different uh, ideas and the wiring up of my mind yeah, and the way that uh, I see things and the way that I was taught, uh, taught from my uh, elders. 
The book is a combination and a conglomeration of 50 years of all of this different knowledge and all of these different teachers that have taught me a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And most of the knowledge that I've received is uh, knowledge that is not knowledge that's on the main path, you know. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's off the beaten path. It's less traveled, yeah, but well more worth it. Even in throwing net, like in the book, there's so much value in throwing the net. If you just, even if you just read the story, right? Like just in that one story, it's so much information, you know, about how to live your life, yeah, correctly. So really, the book is really not a Hawaiian survival book. It's a Hawaiian way of living book. When you come to another island, it's like going to another continent or to another country. You know, you, you, gotta, you gotta learn how to behave properly. You know? And I think we were taught that by our parents, most of us, to be courteous, to be respectful, yeah, uh, you know, to walk with aloha. So like all the fishing skills and all the fishing places that I go here on Molokai, it was always with someone. Until that person said, oh, just go. I love to be here. Yeah. And I love the mana, and the power, and the, the spirituality of this place. The elements remind me and ground me. Yeah. Yeah. Remind me of, of uh, who's in charge. Yeah. And uh, the beauty of nature, too. Yeah. I mean, just the wind blowing in your face, just the sound of the water. It's like that vibe is just omnipresent yeah and that omnipresent that's God you know that's the creator uh, expressing uh, himself in so many ways Olokai is definitely one of the encyclopedias on my encyclo <laughs> Britannica encyclopedia shelf yeah, it definitely is one of the books yeah for me uh, Molokai not just a stepping stone but but definitely one of the rocks in the Brother Nolan wall. Yeah, and, and, and it's probably one of the ones that, one, one of the big ones at the bottom, that's the foundation.
Brother Nolan's awana has taken him to music's highest heights, but he is grounded by both his spirituality and his practice of the Hawaiian culture. As his career continues, Nolan has grown into the role of a teacher and a mentor, and he now works to share his knowledge and experiences with the next generation. Well, I've been doing Kali since I was 12. The Kali is, is my, the Filipino tradition or side of me, and it's something that I very keep very close to the heart. For me, the Kali, the way I was taught by my master, uh, Uncle Frank Mamalias, yeah, is to keep it very family-oriented and to keep it very, uh, uh, as he would say, underground. And so what the Kali has taught me too, but it is known as a martial arts or a way of defending yourself during the hard times of the Filipino culture. But it's really taught me how to have rhythm Low. And I remember uh, Manoy Frank sharing with me that you use the Kali as a, a means and a way to further your music because it's all relative to, like it's connected by nature. So when I do the Kali and when I teach the Kali, everything is about rhythm and flow, yeah, and smoothness and gracefulness. You know, and they all have to match. That's what music is, you know. Music is different rhythms and patterns and beats and different tempos and you gotta have syncopation, you gotta have timing, and all those things are incorporated in uh, what I was taught by my teacher, which is called the Sayao, yeah, or the dance, the thousand-year-old dance. If I get into a Kali dance, I feel very uh, satisfied yeah, and content, content with my soul. Yeah, it reminds me of my teachers, and then I have this good feeling. It's very pleasant. Besides being physical, and I'm not as physical as I am with uh, Kali now as I am spiritual, because right? all of that stuff has, you know, has uh, matured. And I think that I've uh, come very close in my own path, in my own way of doing the same thing with my music. I can move people, I can stir their emotions and their soul with my music. In the younger years, there's a lot more to say, there's a lot more to uh, repeat, there's uh, a lot more notes, you know, there's a lot more chords. Yeah, and the Kali is the same way, the, the Sayao was a lot more intense, you know, so what became one through 30 is still one and two. You know, and, and but now one and two is so polished. Yeah, so polished and so seasoned. Yeah, that it, it becomes uh, what felt to be so vast and so much is again, very, very simple. Yeah, I like to equate it to like, you know, you can catch fish and you can design all kind Pacific fusion cuisine type of dishes, but Ah, the best fish is the one you just caught. Oh, 
Opelu Lomili Maria Ahe ono Opelu, the big eyes cat. Opelu, lomi li mai. Ahe ono, kuku ke moni. If uh, kids or even adults, if they went back to their primal self, what they are, and everyone's different, what they're capable of, uh, what all of our ancestors learned so that they could survive, so that that person could survive today, you know, that that would make that person a better person all the way around. It sort of began in the mid-90s maybe, the mid-1990s where I wanted to develop, uh, develop it more into like a program or a place where kids could go because I was already working with Palamo Sediment. You know, I was helping kids to survive in an urban environment. So uh, I was always doing those kinds because that those kind of primal skills and stuff because I was always fascinated with that. Yeah. So I was thinking I had already developed a really strong musical curriculum. Songwriting, slack key, uh, ukulele, composition. Uh, for for the DOE, for the state, yeah, for these different entities. So then uh, I, it was a natural order again to, oh wow, well, let's see if I can develop all these skills, all these Hawaiian cultural skills and survival skills that I learned. I want to develop it into a program. And that's what eventually led me to training under the tracking project as well. Because I already was working out some of these ideas with Walter Ridley on Molokai. We brought the kids from Oahu to the kids from Molokai. And then we also included uh, kids from mainland US, uh, native kids to all come together and uh, be in an environment where they all could learn how to live off the land and the ocean. And so that's when I involved myself in the tracking project with John Stokes, where He's kind of got a global perspective of everything and global training, working with all the other native cultures. So that, that was very uh, impactful in my training to create what I have today in my, you know, from the survival handbook to the, to the Hawaiian Inside Tracking Camps. Ama, ama. I Ama Ama is the mullet. Ama Ama Alabai. Ono. Well, just like tracking, right? Like I was telling you, when I studied with all the, the great trackers, you know, like when I was working with John Stokes in New Mexico, the way I had to understand what he was trying to show me was I looked at it musically as we were learning about the tracks that we saw on the ground and he was teaching it to me, yeah? And I was answering him back in the way of my language. And so what I said, oh, okay, so like those 12 tracks that we're looking at, we're trying to understand the story of what happened, what is it, what size it is, all these different things, yeah? But I said, so then each of those tracks, and let's go and count 12 of them, are like notes, notes on the great staff, right? Notes. And he said, yeah, that's pretty cool. And I said, okay, so therefore, if I get the 12 notes, and I chart it out, right? What well, the way that that creature or that being walked, yeah, is his melody. Then that's that song. And inside that song, it's got all the information or the lyrics is like, oh, okay, he's that size. Oh, he was looking up. Oh, he went that way. 
you know. So when I teach the kids today, that's what I say. It's like we're looking for the we're looking for the song of this creature. Find twelve tracks. Well, all of the primal skills, yeah, already uh, help you to exercise all those perpetual values that we try and teach our kids. They're all in there. Perseverance, resilience, patience, calmness, focus, grounding, balance, centering. They're all in those skills. That is the whole reason behind the fire. Yeah, it, it really empowers you, you know. Once, like, say for instance, once Jenny discovered fire, it empowered her and started to, to really, uh, you know, choose choose with confidence what you wanted to do, yeah? And if you think for a moment too, like in nature, uh, we have everything we need in nature. Everything uh, was already provided by Keakua, by God, yeah? And I think that uh, we kind of lost it along the way where not everybody remembers what we don't speak to. If we don't speak to things, yeah, then we don't understand the thing. You know, and if we don't understand something, then we have a fear, we develop a fear for it. And of course, when we fear something, we become defensive. Yeah? First thing we think about is destroying it so it doesn't harm us. Yeah? But nature is not like that. That's not the way God made things. To be able to enlighten a child or a young mind or a heart, yeah? And to see them get it, yeah, is uh, that, that's like the best reward, you know, or to see the happiness, yeah. <laughs> Haina means my story is told now. Haina. In charge of the Mora is our elder, George Kao. Time to cook. As I'm doing these things, they're influencing the music as well, right? Because uh, yeah, it's like if I'm out in nature, oh, I'm gonna write <laughs> more natural music. You know, not more. It's not gonna sound so urban. Gonna be more acoustic, right? Gonna be more organic. Hawaiian man And made of stone And made of sand And as I watch him Walk across that lonely beach 
i found myself surrounded in the sadness of his eyes i know a great hawaiian man his freedom burnt in sacred land but i can feel it in his voice and in his hands and no that once i finally understand i hear his song it echoes in my heart i am the child left to carry on i am tomorrow but i'm living for today holding the wisdom that he gave me yesterday i know a great hawaiian man he is a lonely fisherman last of a breed coming to I finally realize the reason why I carry on and I say sail long soul of the sea spread your wings carry me I am the vision and you are the light Just wanna go The Maui Arts and Cultural Center is proud to present Henry Capono, Brother Nolan, and John Cruz on the inaugural ride of the Rough Riders. Working with uh, John Cruz and Henry Capono. It kind of started with uh, uh, the Kokua for the Philippines. Uh, me and Henry were talking, we were waiting for our, our turn to get in. And he said, man, we should try and do something together, you know, get together and try, try and play. And I said, yeah, yeah, that would be really cool, man. Time for some new music in Hawaii. Yeah, and he said, yeah, you know, kind of wrong. So then we kind of, he kind of said, yeah, you know, like Rough Riders. And I told him, yeah, I like that, like Rough, rough Riders, I like that, you know, and that's kind of how we ended it. And then we make contact with each other the next month and say, hey, let's get together down Sandy Beach. So he and me first met down Sandy Beach and we just started talking about playing our guitars and we weren't playing anything in particular, but we started talking about life. And he said, wow, what if we got together some other guys? John Cruz came. He came down to Sandy Beach too with his van and his throw net and his fishing pole and everything. So that was funny in itself because then he's not a fisherman. And I am. We just come from different walks of life. Then we started learning about where we, we all grow, grew up and uh, our careers and everything. And I think that, that, that that's a beautiful thing, you know. And you first ask, so what, you guys, you think you guys want to go for it? What well, do for it, like, what are your thoughts? Yeah. And I just said, man, I just want to make music. We said, uh, hey, man, we should do some concert or something. <laughs> Foremost, yeah, above everything, we said, man, let's just have fun with it, you know. We, all, we already, uh, you know, have marked our trails, yeah, as individual artists, yeah. So when we get together, let's just have fun and see what we can create. I remember days when we were young. We used to catch a hobo in the mountain stream. Run the coal out hills, we ride on horseback. 
So long ago it seems it was a dream. Everybody! Consciously and subconsciously, as I uh, as I'm maturing musically and in life, and I'm also and getting older at the same time too, like more experiences, all those things sort of sort of like spin. They sort of weave into a, a another way of expressing yourself where with less. Yeah. So that that's not that was thought out too as well. Yeah. And then constantly making that connection with music as a thread. With the stuff the Rough Riders, we still try to be organic. Yeah, but we know that our organic is that our harmonies are are the three guitars and our vocals. But we gotta we know that we gotta be able to make that big. Last night I dreamt I was returning. Then my heart called out to you to please accept me. A musician's career is a journey that begins when music is first discovered. Where it takes you is a result of influences, tenacity, creativity and curiosity, and the willingness to go on that journey. Brother Nolan has been on his awana, or journey, his entire life. His songs are the postcards he sent us along the way, like the great Hawaiian man who wanders the shore in search of fish. My good friend Nolan has been on a musical journey. He said goodbye, poor Lane. Then he took a big ship sailing on the ocean, and he discovered the Hawaiian man is already home through his songs. I think that music is the thread, yeah, it's the thread, and uh, my passion is the web of life, yeah? and I think that uh, with this thread, which is music, I've been able to weave such a beautiful uh, throne net, you know, and it encompasses all kinds of different aspects of life, and music is the universal language, and music is healing, and music does communicate, yeah. So I've been able to take the melodic word and communicate the same things that I have learned. I think I, I lasted this long in, in music because I know that there's so much more landscape to, to discover and explore, you know, and there's enough for everyone. Layer that into like, the aina and the land and the ocean that like there's so much there's so much resources there's so much for everybody yeah kia kua. god gave us so much it's just that we don't know how to use it i just feel that day by day you know like every every note counts now you know every note counts and uh, again that's metaphorically too yeah like everything i do every uh Every encounter uh, I come upon, you know, is, a, is a, a lesson and a test of my aloha and also of my connection with, uh, with God. It's tide oriented, yeah? And, and again, you know, the beauty of the Hawaiian mind or, or uh, their ability uh, to observe those kinds of things, yeah, to observe nature and to make that connection. I mean, all of that is just a whole knowledge that is just incredible how they can tie in the hula with the music, like this. with the ahupua, the land divisions, with, the, with the, the growing of things, with the moon, yeah, all, all just interconnecting, you know, and, you know, original permaculture or, or you know, uh, organic and all those buzzwords they use today. But to me, 
the whole thing, it is musical. Yeah, it's, it's this, again, it's that rhythm of life. And I say what it does, what it teaches me, and what it does for me is it makes me harmonize. When I'm, when I'm not touring or I'm not uh, doing all that stuff, man, I'm fishing. You know, I'm fishing, I'm out in nature, or I'm spending time with, uh, with the family and with uh, uh, the greatest book you could ever read, yeah, the Bible, yeah, the Word of God. Yeah, and then making my connection and my prayers and my meditations to to Nanai uh, Kikumu. Yeah, at this particular time period in my life, that's that's all. That's all there is. <laughs> it's, it's just that. Forty years tells me, but I still got something to say musically. It tells me that uh, that it's important for me to continue to play to show younger people that, hey, you can play as long as you like. <laughs> you know, you're the limit of your imagination. It teaches me how blessed I am to have that connection. Because to me, the music is God. The music is God. And so God has allowed me to continue to play it as long, I'll play it as long as I can. You know, no doubt about it. Like it isn't, it isn't a thing like, it isn't like a career, you know, it's, it's my lifestyle, it's, it's my breath. Yeah, but what excites me and what motivates me and what gives me the energy is knowing that I'm, I'm so much uh, grounded, grounded with Kea to Seek that wisdom, yeah, the source, the higher source. Yeah? Even, even if you say it culturally like Hawaiian, yeah? nanai kikumu, yeah? Yeah, return to the source, yeah or observe the teacher, yeah? This is the teacher, look at this, you know? It's just like this, this is, this is everything, man, you know? Um, <laughs> and I'm the music part of the whole, of the everything. And this has become one of my gracious hits for so many years, for several decades here in Hawaii. And it's about that story. And every time my tutu used to finish, teaching us something about the ocean, he would say, Boy, turn on the motor! Hey boy, turn on the motor! Come on, boy, turn on the motor! There's a time when the sea gets rough, but the fishes, they just move with the sea. What are you doing? Man. Every day I watch a movie with lightning speed. What you got to do is sit down, relax, act patiently. I like the fish in the sea. Hold on, hold on, Cause big ships sailing on the ocean. It's amazing how we learn, yeah. Big ships sailing on the ocean. Tell them that story again. There's a time when the sea gets rough, but the fishes, they just move with the sea. What are you doing, Mr. Man? If they have a trip move and land in speed, what you got to do is sit down, relax, act patiently, I like the fish in the sea. Hold on. Hold on. Fishermen say, big ship sailing on the ocean. Say it again. Big ship sailing on the ocean. We don't need no commotion. Big ship sailing on the ocean. And my papa say, what your papa say? My papa say, what is he say? Say, boy. Boy who? Boy.
a time when the sea gets rough, but the fishes, they just boo with the sea. What are you doing, Mr. Man? Every day I watch you move. Ah, oh, you can't stop moving. Move like lightning speed. What you got to do? What you got to do? Once a year, at least. Come to Hawaii, <laughs> kick back, and sit down, relax, act patiently like the fishes in the sea. We got the whole long, we got the whole long. Fisherman say, big ship sailing up the ocean. Don't you forget it now, big ship sailing on the ocean. Sailing on the ocean, big ship sailing on the ocean. Into the sunset. 